The fortress, the first and last line of defense. What engineering secrets lie hidden within colossal walls, behind massive gates, and deep within their dungeons? The 40-kilometer ring of power, built in just six weeks. The castle that created Great Britain. The world's first invisible fortress. The cannon that destroyed the most durable fortifications in history and changed our world. Brand new research that pushes our experts even further. The battle for the mega fort is our ancient discovery. The colossal walls of history's mega forts still stand hundreds, even thousands of years after they were built. Billions of tons of stone and earthworks across the planet are proud reminders of a mysterious past. So too the stories of the men who built them and tried to bring them down, who created nations and ultimately our world today. To discover them we must journey back to a time when men fought and built to dominate an entire world. In 55 BC, Julius Caesar led a Roman invasion force of 80,000 highly trained soldiers deep into hostile territory. He wants glory. Glory is a great vote winner in Rome. And he also wants money. He wants loot. He commanded one of the greatest armies ever to take the field of battle. It is the classic army of all time. But Roman military might faced a great challenge. The Gauls. This was a formidable enemy. I mean, the Gauls were a sophisticated foe. On the battlefield, they were a match for the Roman army. Six years of bloody battle had not brought a conclusive victory for either side. Caesar's troops, worn down, ground down, were still prepared to take the fight to the enemy. They were prepared to go through hell for Caesar. The Gauls also had a charismatic leader, Vercingetorix. He was fighting not for slaves or booty, but for his homeland. In 52 BC, the Gauls finally managed to come together under their leader, Vercingetorix. They rallied at the hilltop fort of Alesia. Caesar's army surrounded the settlement, and the future of Europe hung by a thread. They'd run the fox Vercingetorix to ground. Both armies readied themselves for the final showdown. Caesar has to take Alesia, or everything he's achieved in the previous six years will probably crumble. Caesar took a decision that is unique in military history. He ordered his men to lay down their arms. This wasn't a battle that was going to be decided with the sword and the javelin. This was a battle, and indeed a war and a country, that was going to be won with the spade. In order to trap the Gauls in Alesia and starve them out, Caesar ordered the construction of a fully fortified stockade that would surround the town. 19 kilometers of defenses to be built in just three weeks. How was this extraordinary feat possible? The Roman army was an incredibly sophisticated, trained and drilled machine. A legion of 80 was divided into 10 contraburnia, or squads of eight men. Within the squad, each man had a rotating daily duty. One would cook, two would guard. The rest would chop and dig to build a fort. They worked a full day of solid manual labor. There was no need for fitness programs in the Roman army. Their entire life was one long physical workout. At Alesia, the back-breaking effort required for 60,000 men to build 19 kilometers of fortification only using muscle was not to be enough. Another danger was on its way, for not all the Gallic tribes were trapped inside Alesia. There's another problem. There's a huge Gallic army of relief heading his way. With up to 250,000 enemy reinforcements only three weeks' march away, Caesar had to move quickly. He has to build another huge wall facing outward. 
Having built one 19-kilometer wall in just three weeks, Caesar had only three more weeks to construct a second 21-kilometer wall, around 40 kilometers of defenses, in just six weeks to create the largest donut-shaped fort in history. He's having to fight inwards and outwards. This is the hilltop fort of Alicia, and this is where the Gauls found themselves trapped by Caesar. And in an attempt to stop the Gauls gathering provisions and fuel, Caesar decided to build a wall around the outside of the fort at the base of the hill. However, the Gauls have managed to raise an army of reinforcements which was approaching from the rest of the country. And so to defend against this, Caesar had to build a second wall, a contravallation which went around the first wall and effectively barricaded himself in between these two walls. And it's from here he successfully managed to defend the world's one and only ring-shaped fort with enemies on the outside and enemies on the inside. A Roman fortification was more than just a wall. Layers of obstacles formed an intrinsic part of the defences. Ancient Discoveries is investigating the details of this integrated defensive system and will test whether it was possible to build such a complicated fortress in the few weeks Caesar had. The mainstay of a Roman fort was its oak wood fence. Damien Goodburn is a leading expert in ancient wood construction. The felling was done with axes. People would cut a V or a mouth or a gob where they want the tree to fall. That's the first cut they would do. And then they go around the back and cut a narrower V, a little higher up the back cut, um, which will eventually end in the tree falling in that direction. The next task is to make the stakes that form the wooden walls, known as a palisade. These stakes are called pales. To make pales at speed, the Romans didn't use saws. They split the timber by hammering in tapered iron spikes. The split timber is quicker as long as you've got reasonably suitable material. But a Roman fortress was more than a wall. When you were building a castle, the objective was to put as many stumbling blocks in the way of the enemy. So you would start off, for instance, by building ditches around the outside. John Naylor is working with a team of experimental archaeologists. Today's test for these men is to try and build a section of palisade and trench the way that the Romans would have done it. We're trying to work out just how much this section of eight men can do in a day. John can then calculate whether Caesar's 60,000 men could have built 40 kilometers in just six weeks with the tools and equipment available. These aren't props. They're not fancy dress. These are real linen tunics, real caligae. Everything from the boots to the tools is just the way the Romans would have had it. So this is a serious attempt at a reconstructive experiment. Experimental archaeology at its best. We've got our two trenches and a wall. This layout is specifically designed to stop the enemy being able to approach that palisade. The palisade on its own, a man could stand on his horse's saddle and jump over. You need the trenches to make it all work. But that trench at 1.5 metres, one and a half yards, it's a difficult jump and a jump that a horse isn't going to like to make onto this. This is deliberately sloppy, soft. This berm is unsteady to land on in between. You, can, you try and jump from one into that middle berm, you end up in one of the ditches. Of course, a horse is not going to land on such a narrow gap as this. On into the second trench. This one's finished, it's full size, and it's already starting to fill with water. The trenches and mounds were further defended with sharpened stakes two meters long. By heating them, they get much, much harder, as hard as iron. These are good improvised spears. Stakes like this, this long, sharp at both ends, Caesar ordered to be placed into pits about a yard deep in a sort of checkerboard pattern in front of the defences. Then he got even more devious. In front of these, he got small iron spikes. These he put in shallower pits, maybe only seven inches below the surface of the earth, then ordered the brush would be piled over the top. The gulls came running along, plunged through the brushwood, and these spikes went through their feet. 
They were pinned in front of the Roman walls where Roman archers could easily finish them off. Hideous, nasty, very effective, my style of warfare. As the sun sets on Alicia, four meters of fully fortified palisade are in place. We've got trench, berm, trench, bank, stakes, palisade. There's no way I'd want to attack that. Allowing for constant skirmishing and injury, the test gives an indication of how long it would have taken Caesar's men to do the job. The answer is an incredible five weeks and five days. The fort was fully erected before the enemy reinforcements arrived. With no hope of resupply or reinforcement, Vercingetorix surrendered in five days. With such an extraordinary achievement under his belt, nothing could quench Caesar's ambition. He went on to become dictator of Rome and founder of the Roman Empire. 1,600 kilometers to the north, Mike Lodes is investigating the castle that helped create Great Britain. This is an act of aggression, and that is what castles are for. Castles are tools of conquest. This is the story of a mega fort built not for defense, but as an aggressive weapon of attack. The medieval British Isles were dominated by violence and aggressive conquest, <coughs> driven by the castle. When we think of power struggles today, we think of power struggles between countries. In the medieval period, it's power struggles between little lords, great lords, and kings and princes, all of whom are vying to control as much land as possible. And that the centerpiece for each lord is to have his stronghold, his castle. The battleground was the territory of Wales, where the barons were rebelling against the English king, Edward I. Edward I was probably one of the first truly great warrior kings. And his whole reign, really, was, I think, um, defined by the fact that he was constantly at war. Many of the barons were fighting two wars, one against the king, the second against the other barons. One of them built a magnificent castle at Caerphilly. This is Caerphilly Castle in South Wales, and it's a fantastic castle. It's a, it's a classic medieval castle. It was built for a man called Gilbert de Clare, who was a powerful baron in 13th century Britain. Now, 13th century Britain is a very turbulent place. Everyone's land grabbing and making their alliances. Gilbert de Clare was a power player. His big enemy, though, was his neighbour, Llewellyn ap Griffith. What Gilbert de Clare did is he put this castle slap in the middle of Llewellyn ap Griffith's lands and said, if you think you're hard enough, come and get me. This is an act of aggression, and that is what castles are for. Castles are tools of conquest. The castle built by Gilbert de Clare was a revolutionary masterpiece of military planning. Its ability to embed itself deep into enemy territory obviously depends on its ability to defend itself. And here you can see that classic castle defense of the moat. The moat makes it difficult to get siege engines up to the walls. The moat makes it difficult in many ways. And you can see there, there is this revetting, this sheer stone wall only the side of the moat. So if you do even get men in there to try and make an escalade up it, they're like ducks in a barrel and they can't scramble out quickly. This is the first moat. This, of course, is a drawbridge. And if you're attacking, this is going to lift up and I'm leaving you there and I'm getting to safety over here. Even if Llewellyn ab Griffith's men could get across the moat, further pains awaited them on the other side. There are aspects of Caerphilly's defence that are as old as fortification itself. Things like these bastions, these, these buttressed towers along the wall here. And what they do is not only do they strengthen the wall, but by jutting out like that, they give you enfilading. So with bows, crossbows, with spears, whatever weapons you've got, you can shoot across the line. So somebody coming up to that wall, there, there's no safe spot for them. Everywhere along that wall, there's somewhere where you can shoot at them or hurl a rock at them. 
And if Llewellyn Ab Griffith's men could avoid the arrows... If that happens, then this great iron shod portcullis will come crashing down to bar your way. Within these heavy fortifications, the inner heart of the castle was a place of security. Castles are not just about attack and defence, they're also for living in. All around this big open space would have been stables and huts for the workmen, for the blacksmiths and farriers that kept everything going. Even in the midst of peace, every precaution was taken in case of war. You cannot have a castle without a spring. And this is the well going down to a natural spring. You must have a water supply that cannot be poisoned. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how thick your walls are, you cannot withstand a siege. They could last out here for months. But Mike's investigations have revealed a potential problem. At first glance, there seems to be a weak point in the defences. It's a universal feature of castles that they have very, very thick walls and what you don't want is you don't want where your arrow loop is to be a weak section of wall because it would be a very thin bit of wall there and the enemy would know to aim their siege machines their great big boulders from their trebuchets to come crashing into these weak spots the trebuchet was every castle's enemy when the trigger was released the three-ton counterweight dropped hurling massive balls hundreds of meters These missiles were easily capable of destroying any weak points in castle walls, but the castle engineers found a solution. In fact, it's one of the strongest parts of the wall because the architect has built this elaborate embrasure. So there are steep angles coming back here, reinforced by this angle here, reinforced by this archway. The consequence of that makes it very difficult for me to shoot my bow. I can't shoot a longbow in here because to shoot a longbow, I need that much room. To pull up a strongbow, I need to be able to move it like that. The longbow is too big to fit into the embrasure, the gap designed to reinforce the arrow loop. So the archer with a longbow is having to shoot this far away. Castle defenders had to be as good with their weapons as their engineers were at design. And there were other mysteries. On the outer walls of Caerphilly are curious holes set at regular intervals of about a metre. These holes supported a wooden structure, the hoard, that overhung the stone walls. In the Middle Ages, these planks would lift up and the soldiers would be here ready and they would be crashing down these great boulders onto the heads of anybody brave enough to get to the base of the walls. Caerphilly Castle proved impregnable and it could be said that Wales would not be part of Britain had it not been for this mega fort. Declare's arch rival, Llewellyn Ab Griffith, never got used to this enemy fortress in his backyard. Caerphilly was never taken. Caerphilly was here stamping its mark in the landscape. And in fact, Llewellyn Ab Griffith was so angry about Caerphilly, he was so angry with Gilbert de Clare plonking this castle in his lands, that when the young Edward I came to the throne, Llewellyn refused to pay homage, and that kicked off the Welsh Wars. That's the snub that made Edward I come into Wales and build a chain of castles. Using the kind of design seen at Caerphilly, Edward I stamped his authority over the land of Wales. Within ten years, this proud, independent country had fallen to the English. But the great thing that he did was to ensure that this wasn't just an ephemeral campaign against the princes, which is what had happened in the past over and over again. He was there to stay. And this was the start of unification that led to the creation of the present-day United Kingdom. However, megaforts were not always symbols of power and aggression. Sometimes they could be quite the opposite. This extraordinary landscape conceals one of the strangest and most secretive defence systems ever devised. When the locals were faced with danger, they simply melted into the ground, leaving no trace.
Ancient Discoveries is investigating a defensive construction that would not look out of place in a futuristic science fiction film. Not all castles and forts are symbols of aggressive conquest. Hidden in this bizarre and magical natural landscape are tiny clues as to a completely different style of ancient defence. Invisibility. Central Anatolia, in Turkey, looks more like a film set than a real place. But for the ancient peoples who lived here, the threat of conquest was very real. You have to look at a map and you realise just how strategically significant this particular landmass is. Everybody had their eyes on this central area. The Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, the Arabs, the Ottomans. Every major empire came to Anatolia in search of booty, slaves and blood. Anatolia is a crossroad in between the East and West, culturally, economically and in every aspect. But the people here were poor farming folk with few natural resources. There's not much ground to cultivate. There's not much land on which you can grow grain. Lacking the wealth to build mighty fortresses, the peoples of Cappadocia opted for another defense. Disguise. The volcanic rock is very easily excavated. And they could dig themselves houses. And of course, large palaces. These palaces and houses were excavated over thousands of years, from 5000 BC right through until the present day. Even now, people still make their homes in them, 7000 years after they were first dug. This complex is the longest continuously occupied fortress in the world. And in times of peace, these tunnels were used to live normal lives. They started to organize their stables and the places where, to, where they could cook and the kitchens and the wine cellars. But they remained alert to danger. From their high vantage point, known as the castle, the people could retreat through a 50 kilometer long network of tunnels and disappear. The immensity of this labyrinth was just one attribute. The Cappadocians had subterranean treasure rooms, vaults where they kept their valuables. And attackers often couldn't even get into the complex because entrances were invisible camouflaged against the rest of the mountainside. It would have been very difficult to attack them. The entrances were not very obvious. There was no way people would know that there was a, such a mass of underground connections. Uh, they wouldn't have known that there was any wealth. The people were, could hide in these structures. They turned disguise and deception into defense. Meanwhile, across the globe in Central America, Ancient people turned the tactic of deception into aggressive counter-attack. Around 600 AD, the Mayans developed an unusual way of defending their own mega-forts. It involved hiding a colony of stinging bees in soldier-like dummies. An ancient Mayan text, known as the Popol Vuh, explains the tactic. They made mannequins. It was as if they had made people. Next, they lined them up on the parapet. And somehow or other, they would, they would coax um, a colony of bees into the head. And these would be mounted on the ramparts of the fortifications. The Mayans would place these human-looking bee bombs on and around the fortress. The idea was that an attacking army would come charging in, and when they swiped at the dummies thinking they were Mayan soldiers, the bees would get nasty. As soon as, of course, they hit it, it, it should shatter, and then all the bees would come out. When they get aggressive, they don't differentiate between anybody. It would be, I suppose, like climbing into a bucket of barbed wire that would chase you. It's pretty unforgiving, and one hive of bees smashed down amongst the enemy would give you quite a wide area of, of panic. Richard Windley wants to know how the bees will react to being attacked. It's difficult to know just quite how aggressive they'll be. They, they may simply be disorientated or they might actually be quite, quite aggressive. Um, it, it's, it's going to be me that's going to actually be um, striking the head. So if I turn and run, then it will be for a good reason. <laughs> there is one difference. 
will have protection on, whereas the soldiers who were attacking these um, fortifications would be wearing um, not very much at all. But even a modern beekeeping suit is no guarantee. But sometimes you get, you get bees that are more intelligent than others. And they realise if they can't get in at the top, they'll get in at the bottom. And if your ankles are exposed, I've had them change my shoe size a few times. Can you tell us the horror stories after we've done it? <laughs> <laughs> For safety reasons, Richard is performing the test in daylight. But it was at night that the deception was most effective. One can imagine that that sort of flow of adrenaline, the, the apprehension, going into battle for the first time, they would be like a sort of hair trigger. They'd just be waiting to whack something. They'd be waiting to actually, actually attack. At first, the attack looks like it hasn't worked. The bees stay around the head. Bees only become airborne and active within a certain temperature window, depending on the species start to get their bearings, I think they'll be a lot more airborne. But soon the bees start to warm up and take to the air. This is still sort of reasonably intimidating, actually. If, if I was just stood here with bare chest and bare head, I think this would be pretty scary. I mean, I'd be out of here fairly quickly, I think. I wouldn't want to hang around. But Richard's clothing is protecting him from more than the first sting. Of course, once one of these things is stung and that scent gets into the air, then the whole thing will wind up and they'll get more and more aggressive. As with all bioweapons, there is an element of luck. The night couldn't be too cold, plus the bees would need to start stinging to make the other bees aggressive. That being said, any defence is better than none, and the bee-filled dummies would have complemented other more traditional methods of defence. In 1453, during a great siege, the largest cannon that had ever been built was put to devastating effect. It was commissioned by Sultan Mehmed II to destroy the walls of one of the largest and most durable fortresses in history, Constantinople. To understand why the great Sultan went to such lengths in his efforts to take the city, Researchers are piecing together evidence that stretches back thousands of years to the empire of the Romans. In 300 AD, Rome was ruled by one of history's most celebrated figures, the Emperor Constantine. What set Constantine apart from earlier emperors was his conversion to Christianity. Constantine stamped Rome onto Christianity and stamped Christianity onto Western Europe. Without him, Christianity may not have become the great religion of Europe and the Middle East in the first millennium. But the Emperor Constantine had a dilemma. During the fourth century, Rome was threatened by barbarian tribes from the north. Constantine decided that the struggle of defending Italy wasn't worth the candle. He decided to move his capital 1,400 kilometers east to the city of Byzantium, which he then renamed after himself Constantinople. And finally, Constantinople became the successor to Rome and the Roman Empire. A new Rome. The Roman Empire wasn't over when they moved to Constantinople. It had just regrouped and moved to a stronger position. The secret of its success was its location, surrounded by water on two of its three sides. But the new capital had one strategic flaw. On its uh, rear side, it just has this very flat, undulating country. Uh, so what the Byzantines have to do is they have to develop massive, monstrous walls in order to protect themselves. A large inner wall provided elevation from which to shoot arrows, larger catapults, even cannon. Beyond this, moats and lower walls provided further lines of defence. Nick Hall, keeper of artillery at the Royal Armouries, has travelled to Turkey to examine this impressive construction. By the addition of a moat and subsidiary walls, as we have at Constantinople, you've got defence in depth with a very good chance, as long as you've got enough defenders, of keeping the enemy at a safe distance. 
and between each wall was a gap called a peribolus. If attackers could make it past the first wall, they were then caught in a killing zone, trapped between the two cliffs of stone. Constantinople was a wealthy and tempting prize, but these walls were so dominant and defendable that no army was able to capture the city for over a thousand years. If the forces were evenly matched and there was plenty of food within the city, it could hold out practically forever. But by the 15th century, hundreds of years after the fortifications were constructed, the world was a very different place. A new emperor, Constantine XI, was on the throne of the city and the empire. But to the south and east, a new religion was growing in power, Islam. Islam had conquered most of the lands around Constantinople, leaving a tiny island of Christianity surrounded on all sides. They had managed to encircle it. They controlled all the eastern coast of the Bosphorus. They controlled the hinterland in the west. They could put a complete cordon around the city. Constantinople was the last Christian outpost in the East Mediterranean. Among the tribes that had been converted to Islam were the Ottoman Turks. The Turks were a Central Asian tribe that due to infighting and rivalries and population pressures expanded to come west, finding the borders of the old Roman Empire. The leader of the Turks in 1450 was Sultan Mehmed II. He'd formed the idea that Constantinople would be the crowning glory of his sultanate and he wasted no time in preparing in his mind how he would go about this great undertaking. Mehmet was not to be underestimated. Being dynamic, aggressive, enthusiastic, ambitious, he was obviously going to get into action as soon as he'd gathered his forces. He could also tap into the Islamic concept of jihad. Islam is an expansionist religion. That was the message of the Prophet Muhammad, to go out and spread that word, just as Christianity is an expansionist religion, sending missionaries all over the world. He sincerely believed it was his duty as a good Muslim to take the Christian city of Constantinople. Mehmet began preparing for war. He wasted no time preparing his huge army. Behind their walls, the tiny Christian population of Constantinople watched helplessly as thousands of Muslims rallied to the call to arms. There was a sense of impending doom. The attack was coming soon and they didn't know if they would be able to resist it despite their splendid walls. And this was Mehmet's problem, how to breach walls that history had shown to be unconquerable. The ambitious and ingenious Sultan turned to new technology, the cannon. What Mehmet the Conqueror did is he employed a Hungarian gunfinder called Urban. Urban proposed using a new Western technology, the mega cannon, also known as a bombard. Building a bombard was a major undertaking. It was right at the limits of the possibilities of late medieval technology. The technical skill required was extremely high. This was a new weapon and a very important one, but the size of the cannon was critical. This was in a, in a new league. It was a different category of weapon. It was something so ginormous that they, they, they didn't know how to defend against it. Mehmet had commissioned not just any bombard, but the largest one the world had ever known. Ancient Discoveries is conducting a unique experiment with this historic cannon. Nothing like it has been fired for hundreds of years. Our experts will recreate the explosion that changed the world. This cannon is a replica of the largest cannon that in 1453 the world had ever seen. And our experts are about to fire it for the first time. Mehmet II and his Ottoman army were waging holy war on the Christian city of Constantinople. His technological trump card was the bombard. These great 
bombards were the super guns of the Middle Ages, the most powerful weapons on the battlefield. They would have to be. The walls of Constantinople had stood unbreached for over a thousand years. The walls of Constantinople struck fear into the hearts of the attackers. The cannon was Mehmet's answer to these walls. This is the very beginnings of the heaviest artillery that has some chance of destroying massive masonry fortification. Mehmet threw everything he had at the project. He poured resources into developing the most powerful bombards he could. Don Mansfield is an expert in firing these weapons. It's a muzzle loading piece, that is to say that it's loaded at the muzzle itself. And when we load it, it has to go right back into the main powder chamber at the back here. The ball itself is then loaded again into the muzzle um, and rolled back. We're going to use an igniter today, uh, a match, electric match, and that will set that off um, from some distance up on the hill there. And that keeps us all safe and sound just in case anything goes wrong. The eight metre long bronze gun was cast in two sections which were screwed together. 400 men and 60 oxen were needed just to move it. On the day the cannon was to be tested, no one knew the impact it would have. A witness to the siege, named Dukas, described the mood in the camp. Public announcements were made to advise everyone of the loud and thunderous noise which it would make so that no one would be struck dumb by hearing the noise unexpectedly or any pregnant women miscarry. The immense weapon could hurl stone balls weighing up to 700 kilograms over a kilometer and a half. These things were so massive and I think always had such an awesome power just from their visual bulk and mass. Thus the cannon was a weapon even before it was fired, a psychological one. Mehmet's bombards alarmed the defenders of Constantinople because they'd never seen anything like it before. But its true power was only realized when it let rip. It was a new, a new technology. The Byzantines had no answer to it. But has the power of the gun been exaggerated over centuries of storytelling? There's only one way to test this, to build one and fire it. I'm extremely excited because I love the sight of firing old cannon. And this is one of the most interesting ones to replicate. It'll be dramatic, it'll look powerful, and I think we'll get some sense of what it was like to be at the siege of Constantinople in 1453. It's been hundreds of years since a cannon like this was actually fired. This really is a first. It's an amazing piece of experimental archaeology. Exactly as 500 years ago when it was brand new, no one today knows how it will behave. Every time it was fired, he was afraid it would crack because the force of, of gunpowder required to throw this absolutely enormous cannonball that was bigger than anything anybody had ever seen and the fact that it could be thrown such a long distance, that meant that it was a really invincible power. Ancient Discoveries has built a reinforced concrete wall 90 meters from the muzzle. The strength wall is scaled to provide an excellent comparison to the damage the real gun would have inflicted 500 years ago. In 1453, the fuse would have been lit with a live flame. Today, explosives expert Sidney Alford is using an electric spark to ignite the cannon at a safe distance. The team retreat out of the quarry. Okay. Firing! Three, two, one. The cannon blasts with unbelievable power. The accuracy and power are devastating. A meter wide hole is smashed in the wall and circular shock waves spread out from the point of impact, weakening the rest of the structure. The stone ball itself is smashed on impact, causing debris to fly back 15 meters. It was only a question of time before one great cannonball went in, really smashed a big hole through which the invaders could climb. The modern test echoes the original violent explosion witnessed by the writer Christovolos. 
There was a fearful roar at first, and a shaking of the earth beneath and for a long way off, and a noise such as never was heard before. Then, with an astounding thunder and a frightful crashing and a flame that lit up all the surroundings and then left them black, the rod, forced out from within by a dry, hot blast of air, violently set in motion the stone as it came out. And the stone, born with tremendous force and velocity, hit the wall, which it immediately shook and knocked down and was itself broken into many fragments and scattered, hurling the pieces everywhere and killing those people happening to be nearby. But Nick Hall wants to collect scientific data about the true power of the impact. Because a cannon like this has never been fired in our lifetime, this experiment is invaluable for ballistics experts and military historians. White stakes are set up directly in front of the cannon mouth at precise 50 centimeter intervals so that the exact speed of the cannonball can be measured. If we measure the speed that the ball is going, we can weigh it. We'll then know the energy in the projectile. We can scale that up to give an idea of the exact power of Urban's bombards at the siege of Constantinople. The cannon is loaded for a second time. Again, the explosion rocks the quarry. Again, the accuracy is exact and further damage is inflicted on the Constantinople test wall. But can it be measured? The ball destroys the sticks at a rate of 1.2 milliseconds per 50 centimeters. The mathematical formula for energy of a projectile tells us that a ball weighing 45 kilos and moving at 260 meters per second will smash into its target with 1,521 kilojoules of energy. This is greater than the energy delivered by many modern tank shells. This is a real vindication of medieval technology. With careful placement of his cannon, Mehmet brought the city of Constantinople to heel in just eight weeks. The fall of Constantinople in 1453 is a tremendously significant event. History was changed forever. An Islamic sultan had captured the prize of Christianity and stood on the steps of Europe. The conquest of Constantinople became a blueprint for the way that the, that the Muslims would attack major centers in the West. And of course, they were going to be attacked again and again and again. And if they could have conquered all those uh, cities, they would have imposed uh, Muslim rule. And what happened to Constantine and the city itself? He died in the fighting. So he went to his death defending the city. And that was a martyr's, uh, the cause of the martyr. And he gave his life for Christianity and his city. Yet Constantinople, a settlement for 10,000 years, lived on. Constantinople had a, another life as an Ottoman capital. And it was beautified and went into a new phase of life as a spectacular Ottoman capital. From the awesome power of the Turkish bombard to the organic early bio-warfare of the ancient Maya, the battle over history's mega forts has produced some ingenious attack and defense systems. Whatever the local needs or resources, the aim has always been the same, to control the castles that control the land. Ancient discoveries has shown how these battles not only changed the lives of the people who fought them, but how their consequences shaped history. The part played by mega forts in the story of humanity goes further than the bricks, stone and iron that make up their facades. They help create the nations we live in today.